That's the move. I think You're an interesting dude. <laughs> I love it. I'll try to be. I'll try to be extra interesting for this. Superbly interesting. <laughs> so give me the. Can you give me the spiel? Like, who are you? We we met through the the ten thousand small businesses, the Goldman Sachs ten thousand small businesses program, mm-hmm. and. From there, I guess the next point of entry was your Instagram, which has an interesting story behind it. Mm-hmm. But who who are you? So I am somebody who has been searching for my purpose for a long time. I felt like I've always had a lot of energy and a lot of insight. And it's been hard for me personally to navigate all of that and to be mm-hmm. able to actually get to a point where I could feel like I fit in in the appropriate way and I could contribute in an appropriate way. Um, And that's really what led me to starting my own business. Yeah. Um, So what's your name and what's the business? Oh, sorry. Did I forget the most important part here? Um, Michael Dali Mole, and I am the founding partner and co-owner of Goodwood NOLA. Goodwood NOLA. Yes, sir. So Goodwood is a custom design and fabrication firm here in New Orleans. Um, We are sustainably focused and... We like to kind of approach our work with a human-centered um, feel. You know, th- for us, it's um, it's all about the outcomes. It's not just about cashing a check and doing a project. It's yeah. about outcomes. You know, in our industry, maintenance and um, the life after you're finished with the contract of your product is really important. So, for us, we figured, what is the one thing that we could do differently, mm-hmm. which turned into a lot of things. But to start, the one thing was. Let's make things that last, right? Let's yeah. build with with the, this sustainable, not just in terms of a footprint, but also in terms of like, will this thing last and will it stand the test of time? Um, so we put that stamp on everything, you know? Uh, and especially in the beginning of, of Goodwood, we we produced a lot of things that we were we felt like we were kind of still learning throughout that process. And sure. when we get those phone calls, we go right back to those initial first, you know, four or five projects and we fix everything. We build it up to our current standards. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have a new focus, which is kind of this sustainability mission that we've, we've been on. Okay. Um, but r- really the, the whole catalyst to the company was us seeing this void in the market where people were just building to cash a check and to move forward with whatever, you know, their, their agenda was. They weren't building for things to last. So they were kind of you know, foregoing the quality and the longevity of their product for just, you know, the next job, cashing the checks, keep it coming. We're, yeah. we're, we're in a pretty tight margin industry, so it's hard to kind of sit back and approach a project with the right uh, thoughtfulness. So Cause it, Because there's so much pressure just to go yeah. and to scale and to Lots industrialize in a way. Yeah, so especially commercially speaking, we have clients that are on tight timelines, they're on tight budgets, mm-hmm. they're really restrained, uh, and that doesn't really create the best recipe for fine furniture. So we've had to kind of navigate through all of that to figure out our process in actually getting to the point where we can say, yes, we can meet your timeline, yes, we can meet your budget, sure, and yes, we can also give you you know, heirloom quality furniture that will stand the test of time. So you're making crazy high quality stuff. Yeah. Like if yeah. you go to your if you go to your Instagram, you you guys have like 10,000 followers. You've got beautiful images of of everything from like mid-century end tables mm-hmm. to these like sinker cypress slabs that you guys you guys finish up beautifully and then you yeah. you put legs on them, you turn them into dining room tables. Mm-hmm. You do like hotels, bars, all of it. All the above. All the above. What, mm-hmm. Where are you the are you the highest tier of when somebody's looking for quality they come to you mm-hmm. is that what it is Yes so you know we're we're most of our business is B two B so mm-hmm. uh, we are a fine furniture studio but we can scale the production of a project based on the budget and timeline Sure So if we have a client that says Hey I'm looking for this really perfect credenza for my you know, for my bedroom at home, I don't care how long it takes, I don't care what the budget is, we're going to build that very differently than we're going to build a credenza for, say, um, you know, a restaurant or a hotel that's looking for something that can be beaten day after day, that can, you know, the doors are opened in one week, the same amount of time they'll be opened in a whole year at your house. So the commercial quality and scaling with the commercial quality definitely changes the way that we produce furniture. Um, There are traditional means of producing fine furniture, and then there are commercial means of producing fine furniture. How do you get into this industry? 
Oh boy! Because you mentioned that you did a little, <laughs> you did some bouncing around. Yeah. So how, how how is how is fine furniture the the industry that you find yourself in? How how is fine furniture in New Orleans where you yeah, find yourself? Yeah. So personally, I was I, I, I was brought to New Orleans through school. I went to Tulane and, mm-hmm. and I stuck around after. Um, the city just grew on me, and it's like a it's like a, a sweaty, humid summer day. You know, you can't get it off. So yeah. um, New Orleans just stuck to me like like glue, and I've been here ever since. Um, so that's how I'm here in New Orleans. And the furnishings and, and, and custom furniture, that's kind of where we've arrived at based on our trajectory. So we set out initially to do um, custom architectural fabrication, which is really different than fine furniture. And so while we still provide that service and it, it makes up for quite a lot of our business, our focus and the gear we wanna put ourselves into moving forward is really with furniture and fine furnishings. Um, so long story short, I met my business partner while working for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And we connected because we were two of the younger people on site. Um, and we were kind of looking around us thinking to ourselves, there's quite a lot of people older than us, better than us, that are making only a little more money than us and what's the future like here for us? So uh, those those questions geared us toward kind of searching for alternatives. Sure. Um, we were presented with a really amazing opportunity through the guys at District Donuts, and they took a big chance on us. So we kind of made the decision to quit our jobs. We decided to just go full steam ahead with this thing that just you know turned it. into Goodwood, and um, the the small District Donuts on Magazine and Arabella uptown. That was our very first project. So no kidding. Yeah, that was done on a on a ridiculously tight budget, but we really had we had something to prove. We wanted to kind of put our name out there in in the right way and knowing that the scene didn't have as many custom fabricators. You know, there are certainly a few that existed before Goodwood, and they're very good at their job, don't get me wrong. Um, But we wanted to do something a little different. So that project was the catalyst to what became Goodwood. And so the the district guys are still great friends today. We do work with them on a regular basis, and they kind of catalyzed this whole thing for us. So it was was really a make-or-break gig you had. Oh, yeah, totally. What was that like? (laughs) That was uh, stressful. To say the least, we yeah. were making close to no money. You know, we, we really, we really stuck our necks out there and just believed in ourselves to the degree in which we said, if we don't do this now, we'll never do it. So hmm. let's put all our eggs in one basket. And uh, even though I would probably recommend against that for entrepreneurs, as, as far as starting a business <laughs> yeah, goes, it you was have just one the, client, the right go. time, the right project, the right people, and they really believed in us and they built us up in a way that I. In turn, I'm trying to do with other younger entrepreneurs now where these guys came to us and they said, look, you guys know what you're doing. Don't stress these other factors. Just do what you do best. Yeah. Talk to us when you need us. And they were really supportive. So, um, you know, like I just said, they're, they're great friends and, and great collaborators and partners. And, um, you know, we were going to do it as a little side gig and keep our jobs. And they were just kind of pushing us. They never said anything direct, but they pushed yeah. us in that direction. And you know, we had a meeting one night when we were about halfway through the project, and we said, "Look, this is just this this demands our attention. We need to quit our day jobs. This is this needs to become our job." So wow. we did that, finished up the project on a really good foot, and uh, you know, here we are today. Oh, that's scary, though, isn't it? Very, because oh, yeah. you're kind of you're making the financial jump, and then Absolutely. you don't know what's going to happen when you finish this project. No, no, and in fact, it was um, on a personal level, it was a tremendous challenge. We we had. You know, like I said, very little money, close to no money, basically enough just to survive. In fact, myself and one of our partners in the beginning, we had to move into cheaper apartments because we just could not afford to live even in the relatively cheap means we were already living While in. you were working on Absolutely. the district. How yeah. long does a project like that take? Like what they sit down with you and I'm wondering, mm-hmm. so they, they've identified a couple of guys who they think are really expert at what they do. They go, right. we're going to open this restaurant. Was that the first one or was that the second one? That was their second location. Their second location. Correct. Yes. Their so they go was on Magazine and Jackson. That's the one by Steins. Correct. So they they they've already built a restaurant. Mm-hmm. They see something in you. They go, okay, we really like these guys. Yeah. What is that first conversation like? Do they say? Do they sh- they show you architectural plans? They say, build a bunch of four tops. How, how do you even? I don't I don't know where somebody even begins if you're right. going to start planning how to open a restaurant, let alone plan what people are going to sit on. Right. So the process today 
for us would look very different than it looked when we did this project because yeah. we had no experience. So at the time, it looked like a handful of meetings where we were kind of trying to get our bearings and understand how do we do this whole business thing because none of us had that experience. So the building was, was, we had much more experience with building, even though looking back now, it's like child's play compared to what we're doing today. But yeah. um, we had no business prowess. You know, So for us, it was really about understanding, okay, we get this check and we need to allocate funds to all these things. How do we do that? How do we make sure we're gonna have enough money to eat dinner at night, you know? Yeah. So um, that was definitely a struggle on our end, but in general, the project, um, it, it went really smoothly for all things considered. Um, it was really challenging for both parties in certain regard, but um, at the end of the day, I think being their second venture out of many, because now they're just, they're, they're off with the wind now. They're doing fantastic things as a company. Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, they were still really trying to get their feet off the ground as well. So they were still a startup at that time as well. You oh, know, they so had, they understood the kind of entrepreneurial mindset? Oh, totally. And I actually have to say that without those guys being so understanding of our situation, the project probably would never have got, gone the way it did. Wow. Um, which was still trying at times, but at the end of the day, it ended well, and we were all happy with the result. So we know things could have been done better, and... Um, you know, looking at everything in retrospect, it's always 2020. But for me, the the value in that was learning a lot about business on that first project, and yeah. then trying to use that knowledge moving forward and and to build upon it. But also to understand the value in those relationships because these guys, um, you know, they're they're good friends of ours now, and and we we talk to them regularly. Um, they always come to us for any projects, whether it's within our scope of capabilities or not. So we're kind of vetting things for them now. Um, and it's just a really wonderful dynamic. So I think out of all of the things that went well on that project yeah. and all of the things that went poorly, the best result was our relationship with those guys. So what happens when that project closes? Because so, you, you just made some, you made a mega jump. Mm -hmm. You've done the entrepreneur thing. I'm sure Started in your, yeah, in your mind, are you thinking I'm an entrepreneur? Or in your no mind, way. are you thinking we just have this project and we want to knock it out of the park? Yeah, the, the latter. So we we did not view ourselves as entrepreneurs at that point. We were still um, fish out of water. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were trying to figure out where to land. We, we had no idea. So um, we got lucky again by saying, okay, look, we're in it. We're going to do this. But we didn't have any means of getting business. So for us, we were thinking, okay, do we put our money into marketing? How do we like take this small amount of money that we actually, I wouldn't really even consider profit, but just, just revenues from that project that we sure. could spend on a lot of things. We decided, okay, look, let's maybe spend this on some marketing and publicity. Let's get our name out there. At the last moment, we did not do that because we had two other people that were close to the job site that had kind of popped their head in a few times while we were building the project that mm -hmm. came to us right before we made this decision and said, hey, look, I have this thing I want you to build. Can you do it? We said yes. We said yes to everything. And All everything. of a sudden, more work shows up. Starts slowly trickling in. And then after about eight months, it was like a waterfall. It just all started pouring in. Um, and we couldn't, you know, we couldn't, we didn't know what to do with all the work. So we started to bring some people on board to help us, started mm -hmm. to find space. Um, and that's when it really catalyzed what is now Goodwood. So um, what happens after? The answer is for us, what happened after is where we are today is everything. So wow. um, that project completely catalyzed our careers in this industry. And how long have you been operational? So we're going into our fifth year now. Oh, congrats. So in January, we'll, we'll, we're turning four on January 27th. Okay. And that begins our fifth year of business. That's, that's good problems. Yeah, our, our, good, our buddy good Jonathan Johnson calls them champagne problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eight months down the road, all of a sudden you're yeah. totally upside down with so much work. Yeah. Why? Like, why? What was it that separates Goodwood from other other fabrication houses or production mm -hmm. houses? That's a great question. That's a question that um, I'd say if I told you I knew the full answer. I would still I would be lying because we're still developing who we really are. We know mm -hmm. that we have certain things that separate us. Um, today, what separates us is our sustainable approach to doing business. So yeah. sustainability is massively important to us. Um, 
we work with a, a great group here in town called Life City. They're basically sure. a sustainability Liz consultancy. Over there. Yep. Yeah, Liz is great. She kind of helped us develop metrics on our sustainability to mm-hmm. allow us to become an exemplar in our industry. So um, we have great ratings with Life City as a sustainable business. And what's really interesting and unique about Goodwood is we've taken a very uh, consuming business and made it so that we're not really consuming that much at the end what of the day. What does that mean, a consuming business? So we consume loads of raw materials. We consume loads of um, people's time and energy from vendors, from clients. So we are we just, we just consume a lot. It takes a lot for us to produce a product. Um, maybe that's a better way of putting it. Is so, it a wasteful industry? It's a very, well, it depends on how you do your work. It can be very wasteful. Mm-hmm. For us, it is not. So we've implemented programs and, and strategies within our operation that allow us to be very, very sustainable in an industry that's typically um, pretty unsustainable. What are what are examples of things that you would do different mm-hmm. or things that would just drive you nuts that were wasteful? So one great example is the wood that we use when we use when we're using lumber that isn't engineered, meaning like plywoods, when we're using okay. hardwood stock, um, when we mill that lumber, we save all of our shavings and sawdust and we donate that to local farms from for mulching, for um, beds, for animals, for all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So that's one way. So a lot of fabricators and, and, and makers in town will say, well, let's use a uh, plywood here or a veneer here because there's a lot of waste produced. What we say is that compromises quality and therefore we don't want to do it. So let's navigate around this issue to find a better solution that allows for us to use the appropriate material, sure. deliver the appropriate product at the quality we're happy with, and then also use that waste waste uh, for something better, you know, to, to let's let you know one man's trash become another man's treasure, so to speak. So that's one really easily understood example. Um, we also plant trees annually with Soul, which is a really great organization here in New Orleans. It stands mm. for Sustaining Our Urban Landscape. Um, they've been a great sustainability partner for us. We have a little initiative called Building the Canopy where we get together annually. We go and plant trees around New Orleans. And so last year we planted about 90 trees. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the goal for us this year, or I guess so we had some delays. It's going to be early 2019. Um, so next year, the goal is for us to plant about 120 trees. And we're trying to scale that up every year. And we plant these trees locally. Uh, last year was Broadmoor, um, Mid-City, and Algiers Point, I believe, were the three locations. Very cool. So that's one way for us to say, yes, we're using you know, lumber. This is These are trees that are cut down. Um, we, we know we could use more trees. Yeah. So how do you offset that? This is our creative way of saying, let's maintain the quality of the product, but let's also maintain the sustainability factor by planting new trees for every tree that we're Wonderful. consuming. So there's there's something interesting that you mentioned, which is that when people play the the cost game, mm-hmm. they start to say, "How can I bring costs down if I'm doing right. uh, a residential or a commercial space?" And you mentioned that most of your stuff is B two B. How much of a difference is it having a real solid community table in the middle of my my business, my community space, mm-hmm. versus something that would be more sort of prefabricated what is the difference that's a great question so there are many differences I would I would say that the most important differences are the functional differences so a table is meant to be a working surface whether Mm -hmm. it's for eating writing chatting whatever you're doing there if your table isn't even and you put down that one cup of water and it spills and that happens a you know a hundred times over the course of the table's life that, to me, is a, is a fatal flaw in a table. You take something so simple like a flat surface, but if you don't actually make it flat, you're proposing issues for the future use of that product. More importantly, things like the rigidity of a table. Um, what happens when that person pushes down on it to stand up and maybe a leg snaps or something mm. shifts in the apron and there's no more support on one side? Um, they sound like trivial problems, but when you compound all of these problems, so you, you talk about an office, well, I would argue that it's not just the importance of your table in that the communal table in, in said office, but yeah. rather all of the furniture in the office. So is it more valuable for a business to, you know, make budget when they're opening their doors, but then have to or replace buy everything all their broken. new again in two or three years? Or is it better value for the business to maybe increase that initial budget, buy things one time with a company like Goodwood that will warranty the work, 
come back and fix things. Because look, it, no one's perfect. We've we've made plenty of things in the past that we've had to come back and fix. Sure. But that in and of itself has so much value to it. Where if you're going and buying something prefabbed, you know, you've bought it, you get your receipt, and you're done. Your transaction's over. There's no yeah. partnership. There's no collaboration. We have so much pride in our work that. I'll be the first one to come there and fix something. You don't have to ask me twice. You let me know once, it's on the schedule. We're gonna come back, make sure it's all right. Because that to me is a really poor reflection on us as a business. And we're trying to do much more than just build furniture. We're trying to build partnerships. What, so, what do you think of when you look at the way that, and I think I see it, I don't know it from the commercial spend, uh, mm-hmm. from the commercial side, but kind of intuitively thinking through anywhere that I've lived in the city of New Orleans and the way that folks acquire furniture, mm-hmm. There's kind of the Ikeaization of everything, right? Yeah. What is what is that to you? How do you look at that? Because you're you're on an entirely different end of the spectrum. Right. Yeah, that to us is, uh, unfortunately, it's become part of our competition. So we've had to find ways to sell certain products at a lower cost because of the fact that we, you know, whether we like to or not, we compete with the internet. Um, sure. So... A good example of that is somebody, you know, we, we often get clients that come to us and say, hey, here's this table I really like, and it's from X company online. Mm-hmm. And my answer is usually, well, then you should buy that company, uh, that table from X company, because that table is probably going to be fine for your needs. Uh, there's absolutely no way we can produce a similar product for you within the same budget. You know, Sure. The, we technically manufacture, but we're not a manufacturer in that regard. So... For us to compete with mass scaled products, you know, on like the Ikeas and the West Elms of the world, um, which make fine products, don't get me wrong, but they're not the same. And like I said earlier- There is a big quality difference. Oh, absolutely. And intuitively it makes me think like there's also a, there's something about every Ikea bookshelf or desk Mm -hmm. that I've ever put together that I I don't own any of them anymore. It's- it's interesting how that has become part of the kind of disposable culture, right? Which is entirely opposite from what you're doing, which is, you know, buy the thing, buy the right thing, make it last forever. Right, and it's not even. I'll, I'll take it one step further. It's not even buy the right thing. It's design the right thing with us, so that you're putting your two cents in throughout the whole process. So, a table is a table. That that sentence right there is like the the, the thing we avoid at all costs at Goodwood. Yeah, because that's not true. If you're going to compare apples to apples, Goodwood product or any type of custom furniture product should never be in the same ballpark as something prefabricated. These are these prefabricated uh, pieces of furniture are built at a massive scale. Um, oftentimes, they're built using materials that are less favorable, um, not sustainably sourced. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of factors that go into it. And one thing that we're trying to do at Goodwood is allow people to open their eyes a little more to the life of their products so the custom furniture we create we know everything about it from inception to delivery we know where the materials come from we know how they're sourced how they're milled how they're delivered Um, we use them to produce a product we know of course everything about that process as well Mm -hmm. and we deliver it to your door the products from the big box stores and all of these online retailers you could try your hardest and never figure out the story of that product and how much waste it's actually producing to deliver it to your doorstep so on the sustainability note, there's no comparison. And on the quality note, there's no comparison either, yeah. really. So you're really investing in, yes, furniture, but also a partnership. I can't stress that enough. We become, every client is a partner. We've never turned our heads at any client that's called us to say, hey, I have this issue with that piece you made me or with that sure. store you built for us. We've never turned our backs on anybody. And that, to me, is a in a, an added layer of value in going the It's just a route. different kind of service. Like you Absolutely. guys you guys are just not trying to be Wayfair. No. Because if no, you're no. on Wayfair, I don't I just want the bar cart. I don't care where it came from. Right. I kind of know that it's going to be a little bit dinky, but maybe I don't buy my really heavy pieces off of that, right? Wayfair I get my accessory pieces. Totally. Or Joss and Main is the other is the other popular one. For you it's and it makes sense it's intuitively makes sense why the sort of pocket it seems for you are like these these restaurant or hotel build outs. Right. Is that where the majority of your your work is? Are those kind of your ideal ideal workspaces? Yeah, I think you well, yes, to a degree. So um our our forte 
has has become this, these commercial projects, these B2B transactions where we're coming in and understanding the flow of a space, the ergonomics of your restaurant, sure. hotel lobby, retail store. What Do you have any really good local examples of them? Oh, yeah, there are plenty. Um, so some really successful projects that just recently wrapped up. Um, we did the... So when I say we did, there's plenty of other people involved in these projects, ju- just to make that this very clear. This is like in, in the construction world, there's exactly. a million there's subs. Exactly, there's contractors, there's... architects, designers, um, interior architects, exterior architects, landscape artists. There's a million people involved in these projects. So mm-hmm. with all due respect to all of them, I'll say our project, but there's a lot of other people that made these projects look great. Um, so restaurants like Emerald's Nola, that was a, a massive renovation project last very summer. Very cool. Um, we did that with a lot of excellent people that, that also do good work here in town. Um, that was a project in which, you know, for almost two and a half months before we even started building, we were doing walkthroughs. We were designing, we were engineering, we were, um, you know, talking about the flow of the space. Uh, how do you get from A to B? Are you going to bump into a server? Is the door going to open and then people can't pass through? Mm-hmm. Um, code issues, all of that stuff. And then you have to balance it with the aesthetic. So that's a, a, a recent example. Jack Rose Restaurant in the Poncho Train. Um, that was a really great project. Uh, we worked with excellent designers, architects, and, and um, the same contractor we worked with uh, for Emeralds Nola as well. Oh, very cool. And another example of understanding, it's a, it's a game of inches, you know. In fact, sometimes it's a game of, of centimeters where if these tables, if we're producing 40 tables for a restaurant and we're producing the seating for a restaurant, that gives us the ability to say, okay, client sits here and they eat here. So now we know the whole dynamic of the range of their time in that restaurant, right? From the time they walk through the door, when the hostess walks them to their table, we're understanding the spaces that they're going through, how much room they have, can they have luggage with them? You know, there are certain projects we've worked on that are in closer proximity to tourist uh, destinations. So people wanna make sure people can roll bags through, little things like that. Most people won't take on the breadth of those challenges. Sure. Whereas that's what we thrive in. So it's almost a design thinking mentality. It's absolutely a design to, thinking mentality. So to you, it's even bigger than the single piece. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about why. So we start every project with why. Um, and that's probably one of the big things that separates us from our com- competition is that everything is, is human centered. It's mm-hmm. all about us figuring out why you want what you want. So if you come to me and say, hey, I want this desk. Okay, well, you could get any desk. Why do you want a desk from us? Oh, well, I like your other work. Okay, that's great. So that those first few questions allow me to understand the trajectory of that project with the client. If they're coming to us for a really nicely designed, beautiful piece of furniture, wonderful. Yeah. Then we have the clients that come to us and they say, we need all of these things to work in harmony with one another. We need people to be able to get through the space comfortably. We need wheelchair access. We need all these things here. And they throw a packet of information down at the table. Those are the projects that a lot of people run from. We run toward those because those are awesome for us. We love being able to have our hands in more than one piece in a space. It allows us to dictate some of that flow and some of the just ease of use of the space. So more than one piece. That would be like tables, bars, yeah. side tape like what, what would that entail yeah exactly what you just said that would be us so for for example we'll talk um we'll use jack rose restaurant as an example okay. so we did the banquettes we did the server stations and the credenza pieces mm-hmm. and we did the tables so for us the reason that's so nice is that we don't have to knock on someone else's door and ask them, hey, what are your dimensions for that seat? Is it gonna work with this table base we wanna buy? Is it gonna work with the tabletop? We wanna put glass on top so it's gonna be an extra quarter of an inch. Is that gonna affect your seating position? We don't have to ask those questions. We know that stuff because we're doing all of it. So when we have that full scope of work under our belt, we get to actually make decisions that we like to think are better. Um, Because what that does is it gives us more work, which is wonderful. It gives us more ability to make things harmonize better. Yeah. And it also gives the client a sense of security knowing these people care. So I'm not just going to give them one thing. I'm going to give them four or five, six things to do for it's this project. And then they kind of push it to us knowing that we have a lot of pride in our work and that we take this uh, unique approach to kind of solving their problems. You know, it's not just a table. It's not just a seat because those things affect your customer's experience. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, 
do you open a restaurant to just make food and sell it or do you open a restaurant to build traction in a community and to gain a following and to have people say wow that meal was great but the service was better and the seats were comfortable and the tables were beautiful and the artwork was amazing you know those it's nuances about, it's things that last yeah absolutely. things that really last things that last but also things that make a lasting impression it's not just about physically lasting it's about people carrying a positive uh I won't say review, a positive um, feeling about that space or that environment with them whenever they, they leave, you know? You is want it them invisible to in a lot of ways? Because mm -hmm. what you, I've heard the yeah. phrase that, I've heard the phrase said that a good design is invisible. Mm -hmm. It's one of these things where it's it's so intuitive. It's the, yeah. the preeminent example is like the iPhone, right? Anyone can pick it up. It doesn't come with a user manual. You just use it. Yes. And it sounds the way that the way that you talk about space and moving through space and moving through high traffic spaces like restaurants, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're designing things so that you've already solved the the clients or the waiters problem before they've even walked into the restaurant. Yeah, that that is a great point, and it is totally true. So the reason a lot of people overlook that is because the reason people are professionals is they make it look easy, right? So you walk into a certain restaurant and everything goes great and you leave full and happy. A lot of times you overlook the actual design of that space. And I don't mean yeah. the design like the color of the paint and the patterns on the floor. That is certainly design, but there's a, a you know, we, we like to call it just the ergonomics of the space. You know, the way that a human being flows through the environment. And so that is invisible. That's not, you know, you don't have yellow arrows on the floor pointing where, you know, you, you have to show somebody by kind of leading them through without physically being there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a big part of our job. And, and that's a big part of interior architecture. So we're lucky enough to work with fantastic architects on a regular basis that really take that to heart. And they, they design spaces so intentionally that it makes our job easy. That's not every project. We've been on plenty of projects where we have to kind of play that interior architecture role. Oh, wow. Um, but for the most part, New Orleans has great, great architecture firms. Um, and we've worked with a lot of amazing architects who really take the time to think a space through from the second you park your car in the parking lot until you're you know, using the restroom and then paying and then leaving. You know, It's all so intentionally designed that the layman will overlook it, whereas we love that. That's To us, that is like, what makes a space amazing versus, eh, that was a cool spot, you know? What happens when it doesn't work? <laughs> when it doesn't work, um, it usually works. <laughs> we try to put enough time in or to, in a, to make Or an sure example that, <laughs> that wouldn't be your, not through your process, mm -hmm. but when you, because I'm sure you move and you go into restaurants, yeah. you go into hotel lobbies, you see the way that they have things laid out, you have a sense sure. of, you have an intuitive sense of, Oh, if they just move that there, then it would mean this. Yes. What are what is the pain when it doesn't work? So, when it doesn't work without uh, without calling out any specifics, you, you always know when it doesn't work. So, if you're in a restaurant and you're sitting right next to a trash receptacle, that isn't working. Um, if you're in line, if you're if there are three or four people in line at a service counter style restaurant, mm -hmm. and you know your back is up against somebody's table that they're eating their meal at. That's not working. Um, if the line for the restroom, it, or if there can't be a line for the restroom, there's no you know, segmented area for people to kind of queue up for, for the bathroom, it's not working. So those are the things. If you've experienced any of that in a restaurant space to be particular. Oh, all of them, absolutely. Yeah, so that's poor design. All of that is a big part of fleshing out a design. And so that for a restaurant is very different than it is for a retail store, which is very different than it is for a hotel lobby. And do you do you do all of them? You're sort of absolutely, multi. absolutely. And so that was something that we we had no intention of doing that when we started the company, but we kind of fell into it because of how much effort we put into producing high quality work and really caring about the project. Yeah, the partnerships we developed with our clients kind of led us to gaining more insight about how these spaces really work and why they work better in certain spots than others. And that led us to be more of a full service design and fabrication firm. So there was a lot less design in the beginning um, and that 
gaining this knowledge and insight really led us to doing a lot more design because yeah. we had more confidence in doing it. You had it a few under the belt. Yeah, and it wasn't just aesthetic design. It was human design. It was it was flow. It was ergonomics. And so, you know, table heights, for example, you know, there's a two and a half inch range standardized for a table height. Mm-hmm. And that two and a half range is an immense, I mean, it, that's a, a massive amount of space in our industry. Two and a half inches is a wild opportunity to either make or break a table. So what is the difference? Well, what is the, the range? I wasn't familiar with this. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. typically you have about 28.5 inches off the ground, up to 30 inches is standardized, but some people are going up and up and up now. So table height is starting to increase a little bit for certain spots. Um, if you want a quicker turnover in your restaurant, you're gonna have a higher tabletop. Um, and now that's oh, a marginal difference, but what it does is it, it just creates the energy in your customer and it makes that uh, it makes that different. So um, if I want someone to be really comfortable and I want them to stay for two and a half hours, um, I wanna keep serving them drinks, or, uh, speaking about a restaurant, sure. you know, that's gonna be a deeper seat, a uh, more plush type of upholstery or, or if you don't have upholstery, you want a, a, a steeper angle in the back of the seat. Because you um, can lean back a little more. You can lean back. You want a slightly lower table so it's a little more comfortable to put your elbows on. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to expedite the process, you want to turn tables in 30 minutes. Okay, lift that table height a little. The seat becomes a little less comfortable. Fine for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. The angles are changing. The heights are changing. So It's more, it's more closely resembling like a stool or something like this. Sure. That's a great way to think of it. Stools are much less comfortable than chairs, right? So if you're trying to turn tables quickly, bar height seating is a great way to do that. People spend less time there. Now, if it's a bar and not a restaurant, yeah. bar height seating isn't going to affect it. People are going to stay there. So it's about that mentality of... of uh, where am I as a customer? And we can help dictate that mentality on the front end. Do restaurateurs know this when they're, a when lot they're of them starting do. it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. These, are, are, just, these are just tricks of the trade. That... Yeah. And we've, we've learned through trial and error. Um, and there's a lot of information out there about this. Um, you know, as a science, the, just the science of ergonomics and how people interact with things like furniture and, and other objects that they deal with on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've really learned through our experience. Uh, after, a fir- after a few projects, you know, in the first year or two of, of business, we really learned fast about, you know, what making works, things what better for certain clients versus others. And that's led us to where we are now with this really hyper custom approach. You know, it's not, it's not a product that we're selling off the shelf. Yeah. We, there, we don't have a single SKU. We don't have any products. It, it's not like that 100% of everything that Goodwood does is commission and cut is commission based and customized to the client's exact needs. Is that unreal for shops that are doing your kind of volume or your size? Um, is it strange for the industry? No, it's not strange. It's um, there are a handful of, of, of shops and studios in New Orleans doing that, um, and, and they all do a really good job. But the level that we take it to, I think, is a little unique. So. Mm-hmm. We we just have a lot of pride in our work. And for us to say, look, an extra three or four hours on the front end of a project to ensure success is way, way better of a time investment than us just trying to get right to work. And You're speaking our out. language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's that it's the it's the foresight of being able to say, OK, I'm thinking toward the end of the project before it even begins and saying mm-hmm. what what are the steps we can take now? to ensure that success, but also to ensure that we don't have to come back a million times to fix things, you know? We, yeah, we, you're we, saving yourself the headache. Absolutely. You set such a high standard for yourself that you, yeah. you better put it on the front end. Mm-hmm. So why why wood? Well, it's not just wood. Well, it's, it's wood, it's, it, there, it's I, I've seen, so I've seen your shop, I've seen the wood, mm-hmm. I've seen the metal, I see on your Instagram, you're hauling up like sinker cypress from out of the yeah. bayou. Mm-hmm. But what is, what is it about wood? So we started the company the, when the company started, it was woodworking, and which is is that entirely different from what like what is the subset of the industry? No, no, not at all. So, so we do loads of woodwork. I mean, woodworking makes up for almost sixty percent of our of our business. Um, but but now we've we've kind of grown into a a, a true furniture studio. So um, our our proficiencies are woodworking and metalworking. Mm-hmm. Um, we also do loads of work with with engineered materials like acrylics, um, all sorts of different plywoods. An acrylic like a, like a pour over a 
So that would be more of like an epoxy. So I you see. mean something like that you pour as a liquid and it hardens as a solid. So I've seen one of your tables. You've got a yeah. beautiful cut of a, of a slab of wood that mm -hmm. you have processed in such a way where the gaps have been fill, filled. It's a usable yes. surface. Yeah, so that would be, a, that, that's resin. We use resin all the time. So that's definitely an engineered material. That, that, that is uh, one of the many things that we do to broaden that breadth of, of our potential. So we, we want everyone to know that while woodworking and metalworking are the fortes, mm -hmm. uh, we can really do anything. You know, we, we, we've done concrete furniture. Um, we've done- No kidding. Oh yeah, we've done furniture made with bricks. Um, so, you know, that's a big stone component. We, we put marble and soapstone and all sorts of funky things on top of, you know, metal bases that we've made. We've sure. done projects that don't have a lick of wood anywhere near them. Um, so for us, the, the goal was never to be in a position where we were like, hey, we do everything, because that's kind of like a, you know. It's a catch-all for not really being good Absolutely, and it's not really a, it doesn't make anything easy, you know, to mm -hmm. say we do everything. So um, I say that, but what we really focus on, uh, our, our main materials are wood, metal, and when I say metal, it's primarily steel, aluminum, um, lots of brass. Um, Copper, so you know we'll, we'll play with all of those other alloys as well, um, and with concrete we use one specific type of concrete, mm -hmm. and we use that specific type because of of the quality of it. It's not your typical uh, two dollars a bag type stuff that you sure. know you fill potholes with, but um, this is really nice um, fiberglass reinforced concrete. So it's really made for furniture, and and it's made to stand the test of time. Now, what is what is concrete furniture? Co what is concrete furniture? Yeah, what what. Are, Concrete furniture. Place an image in my mind of sure. what that would look like. So the the most that will, well, that's not true. The, the thing we do the most using concrete would be surfaces. So countertops, tabletops. Um, we love to play with mixed media applications. So concrete tops with wood inlays or, or brass inlays, um, just to kind of make it a little funkier and fresher. Uh, so surfaces. Or to, to the short answer, surfaces are what concrete works best for mm -hmm. in our in our world. Um, but you can make full furniture out of concrete. So you can make chairs out of concrete, benches. Um, you can make cabinetry out of concrete if you want. You know, and this is um, a thing you're pouring into into a mold is like a absolutely single, yeah. So we don't really piece. do any pour in place type of, of work with our concrete. Almost all of it is done in the studio, where we're making forms and molds and we're pouring it into those forms and molds to create a product that we can then polish and buff down into something that looks really refined. Wow. Uh, when you pour in place, and that would be like- And that'd be um, pouring in the actual place where Yeah, like if live. a restaurant wanted a bar top out of concrete, you would pour that in place on site. Mm -hmm. We try to refrain from that because it doesn't allow for the same quality at, at the end of the project. Uh, we, we can ensure quality in our studio when we have all the tools and everything right there sure. at our fingertips. So um, we've, got, we've gotten creative with all of that, but we've done, um, We've done full bar tops in concrete before. The, the District Donuts in Elmwood, it has a full concrete bar top. And how big is that? Uh, that's that's pretty big. The, the bar top is about um, maybe 30 feet of, of continuous concrete. Um, and then we have other projects where we've done concrete tabletops or concrete surfaces that are um, segmented or sparsed out. Uh, but it's really, it's an excellent material for, for someone who needs something highly durable. It's also great for outdoor use. So wood outside is like pretty much always a no-go. Um, it needs to be the right application for mm -hmm. our purposes. So we're not framing, we're not um, doing any type of structural wood application. There, there aren't really any pergolas or anything like that, you know, in our umbrella. So the furnishings in wood outdoors don't work quite as well. Wood, I see. Wood is really flexible material. Sure, um, you're gonna it, get expansion and contraction. Absolutely, on a regular just basis. Just the wear from all the wind and the wet. Yeah. And you can predict that to a degree, but it's usually not worth it. It's usually better to just stick to a material that's going to be more, uh, set you up for more Steady. success. Yeah. Outdoors. So what is it about, is it, you're almost describing like a material science degree to me, just the working with all these different things that you had to figure out. Mm -hmm. What, what do these materials all mean to you? So we have a very real world understanding of, of the materials. Um, we don't have, I mean, we, I say we, me, some of the people that work for me do have formal education in this, but um, I don't have a formal education in, in these materials or in furniture. For mm -hmm. me, it was something that I naturally developed interest for and became good at through just 
uh, trials and, and tribulations. You know, it was really a, a messing up enough. Absolutely, kind of you know learning the, the old fashioned way. Um, but materials are just so important to us. I mean, materials are are should be important to everybody because you know they create our infrastructure as as human beings and what we walk into and walk out of on a regular basis, what we eat at, what, you know, how we get from the first floor to the 10th floor, you know, these mm-hmm. are all infrastructure uh, that's built from materials and somebody chooses the material to use, you know? So having the understanding of what the materials are good at or what they're bad at is really important for us because if we use the wrong material for an application, the only person that that messes up is us because we have to come back and continually because fix it. Because of your forever warranty you put on it. Absolutely. We would, and I'm sure the user experience is injured. Absolutely, yeah. And it, and it just makes a big difference knowing that somebody took the time to think about that ahead and to implement the right process or material mm-hmm. for that application to ensure that success. So where, where do you guys go next? Like you you've had really profound growth. Mm-hmm. You are doing really beautiful projects just in an array of sectors across the city. You're, start of, you're continuing to learn and just master these different niches of the industry. What, yeah. what excites you about the next step? So in general, what excites me the most is that New Orleans is continually growing in such a wonderful way. You know, I think, so I've been here for 10 years now, mm-hmm. and in the beginning of my time, um, there was a lot of pushback, or at least I felt like there was a lot of pushback to this kind of insane growth, um, or maybe for lack of a better word, gentrification, right? And what I've realized now after being here for a little bit of time is that it's really what the city needed to propel itself forward onto a, or, or into a realm of being on par with other large markets that can attract certain businesses and that can attract certain things that will help everyone grow as a as a whole economy not just you know one sector or the other you know Mm -hmm. the whole city is really in a in a growth mode right now um so that excites me a lot being here in new orleans in general um for goodwood we you know we're going to continue doing what we do we've introduced a lot of new um services i would say so yeah we haven't even touched on any of your your volunteer work your trainings right outside of the the tree planting but there's there's a whole lot more that you're up to oh yeah yeah we have workshops that are open to the public Um, we do mentoring we're working on um, woodworking therapies for brain trauma patients we're working on um, you know uh, well you know without going too far into it we're we're working on potential co-working space um, geared towards makers Uh, you know we have a lot of plans in the works. Um, in terms of our commercial application, we are starting to do a lot of upholstery work around town. We have found another big void in the market there. So um, that's going to, you know, you'll probably see a lot of that coming coming from Goodwood in the near mm-hmm. future. We've done a lot of it so far. And um, just like everything else, we, we learned how to do it the right way through doing it a bunch of times. Not totally correct maybe putting too much effort into one one thing not enough effort into another we've gotten that balance down now so um, you'll see a lot of upholstery work coming out of Goodwood you will see um, a a much deeper and larger workshop schedule popping up in 2019 Um, we feel like it's really important to teach the community how to use their hands again Um, that's something that I feel like uh, before it escapes us as a society, we need to grab it and kind of hold on to it. it mm-hmm. It's uh, it's invaluable being able to use your hands in a productive way. Um, e- you know, even just like hanging a TV at home or putting together a, a piece of furniture like you know that you buy from maybe IKEA, um, and not having to rely so heavily on poor instruction, yeah. knowing a little bit on your own about how to do it yourself. So we teach a studio basics class that sells out every time we we put one out. Um, People coming into the shop learning how to use basic power tools, drills, drivers, um, electric sanders. Uh, we also teach them how to use basic saws in the shop, like table saws and miter saws. Um, and you get to produce your own things uh, while learning. So you get to go home yeah. with something fun that you can always look at and say, I made that myself, you know, and think back to the lessons you learned in the workshop. So we're going to be doing a lot more of those. We're going to be bringing some advanced workshops into the curriculum um, for hobbyists and people who have a better understanding than someone who has no understanding at all. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely something to look forward to as well for, for everybody else. It's so dynamic, man. 
yeah, sometimes where, maybe where too can dynamic. people find you? Where's the best place for people to find you to keep an eye on you? So our biggest presence is definitely on social media, Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're in the process of having our website redesigned right now. So hopefully by the end of the year, if everything stays on track, we'll be launching a brand new website that will be uh, very insightful to, to the company. People will be able to understand our story and our purpose yeah. and our mission. Um, and also having a really beautiful uh, portfolio of work because at the moment we feel like we're kind of not keeping up with publishing all of our work and so mm-hmm. when the new website launches the website's going to be the calling card so to speak but for now um, Instagram and Facebook are definitely our two largest platforms to, to see what we're up to and that's just at Goodwood at Goodwood Nola yeah so it's okay. Facebook at Goodwood Nola and at Goodwood Nola on Instagram Good looks, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming by. We've already yeah, gone 50 course. minutes. <laughs> it feels Can like you believe 10. it? <laughs> Rob, always thank nice you seeing so you, much. Man. I yeah, absolutely. It.